welcome to the TX Tomorrow Explored podcast show. I'm Ben Shepard, Managing Director of TX. In this podcast series, we dive into Web3 technologies and their role in the emergence of data economies with guests from some of the most forward-thinking companies from around the world. We talk about innovative ways of engineering data to create value and the next generation of internet technology, including blockchain, decentralization, AI, and machine learning. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the TX Tomorrow Explored podcast. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the episodes today. Uh, we have a superb guest on the on the show today. We have Mr. Llewellyn Morgan, who's Head of Innovation at Oxfordshire County Council. Hello, Llewellyn. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for how's inviting things, me on. How's things over in the UK? Um, interesting, as always, <laughs> with Boris <laughs> in charge. <laughs> Is, are you all still in lockdown? Um, it looks like you're working from home today. We are. We've... Um, we've this this week we've just gone back the advice has come to just go to to work from home again um so we've got into we're not into lockdown we're into slightly more restrictions again because uh covid's going up again right um but we've not gone into full lockdown so schools are open you can still go in but they're encouraging you to work from home again now only a month after encouraging you to go back in the office Okay. okay. So, as always, the messaging is really confusing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're still in the midst of it then, by the sounds of it. It's yeah, like... yeah. I mean, ho- hopefully, we're hoping we can get through the next six months and there'll be a vaccine. Yes, yes, indeed. I've been reading great things about Oxfordshire University, so hopefully, yes. um, hopefully, that will be coming out soon. Yeah, everyone's fingers crossed. So, um, how long have you been with with Oxfordshire? Um, council and what what originally brought you there? Um, yeah, I um, I've been with Oxfordshire for um, nearly eight years now, um, which is a long time. As I came on a two year contract, so um, I've stayed long. <laughs> I was I was brought over to work originally on some of the broadband project work because I used to I managed um, the rollout of um, super fast broadband in Northamptonshire. Okay. Um, so I worked on that and also to, so it was an unusual role. It was sort of half that and half working um, to s- try and set up what's called Science Vale. So the area around Harwell and Cullum, where a lot of the new tech companies have gone now, it was supporting the infrastructure and developing that as an enterprise zone. So it was supporting that area. So um, I think, think that, I mean, the main reason I came down is because I assumed that um, Oxfordshire would work lots with the universities, both Brooks and Oxford University, and it'd be an exciting place to do interesting things. Um, and I thought there'd be massive opportunities um, to do exciting things. I'd, I did quite a lot of working with Northampton University in Northamptonshire, mm-hmm. which is really good and invaluable. Um, so I wanted to try and explore that even further. Um, but I found when we got here, we didn't work very much with Oxford University, so that sort of <laughs> okay. So what I had to sort of build it up the relationships. Yeah. Um, and that's what we've done, and that's sort of where we've grown from is is going out and and talking to um, entrepreneurs and spin outs from the university, and then the local businesses who are sort of more entrepreneurial and wanted to work with the council. Yeah. Um, and we've evolved from that sort of initial idea of if you open up and work with clever and enthusiastic people you can probably think of ways to you know think of uh, of new ideas of solving some of our long-standing problems yeah um and that's so that's it was just sort of built up on that ethos so we were were given free reign i suppose luckily but by some um by my directors at the time who had some foresight and could understand that this was a good thing and we were given some free reign to just go and talk um and build build a network up and understand um, how people could help, what you know, how could they could solve some of our challenges and problems. So we we did that, and we um, we started submitting some big um, 
applications for uh, innovation projects through so in the uk we had the what's called innovate uk it's called the technology strategy board i think it's called there um, <laughs> it's changed its name since we've been here so long um and they were just starting to encourage involvement from local government although when we started you didn't get funded so we the first two we worked on we didn't get funded we supported bids and went, went in as a as a um, using our own um, funding to fund uh, my and a colleague staff time working on them but it it really changed the way we thought about transport so it started out of transport yeah because um, that was the area i managed and it started it just changed the way we would think about the problems um and then from there we developed something called science transit strategy which um if you know the name <laughs> but that's part of our transport policy um, and it was a completely different way of looking at transport policy. So normally, British transport policy is very fixed. Yeah. And it's all, we will do this by then, even though you never do that thing, because you never have the money or something goes wrong. But it's, so it's, it's almost inevitably wrong from the day one. So it was, but it was much more of a, almost a scenario built policy around what the future might look. Okay. So it was just a snapshot of what we thought where the future might be going and how do we have a framework to support involvement in that and make sure those futures um, can happen in a positive way for Oxfordshire. So we were the first authority to have any sort of policy on autonomous vehicles, mobility as a service, um, you know, things, even things like um, shared ticketing and data exchange, those sort of things. And they weren't answers. They were just saying, this is happening. Yeah. Sort of timeline at the moment, we should get involved in this. So how do we do that? And we, the main policy was probably um, adopting a policy of using uh, Oxfordshire as a, a living lab for mobility. Mm. And then lots of, and it's sort of, that was the that was big thing that helped us start a lot of different projects. Um, and you could, it allowed you the foundation to grow projects from, and we, yeah. we, we were lucky to get a few successful ones. Um, and we had a big, a big successful project in connected autonomous vehicles with Oxbotica, who were the spin out of Oxford University. Um, and, and it sort of, I think that gave us the sort of launch that we, we sort of took about two years to get any big projects over the line. And then we had about three or four in a row. Right. Okay. And it grew from there. Cause you sort of, I think that's the key thing I've been trying to tell like the councils and the government. It takes a long, it took us two years to build that network. Yeah. But once you've got that network and that trust as well, so that there's a trust, a mutual trust that um, we actually can bring value to um, a proposition. Um, and then there's also that, that, that belief that, well, if something comes up, I know that so-and-so is going to yeah. can do this and they can do that and you can bring them together quickly and develop it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. also there's an element of imposter syndrome. Um, I think, <laughs> I remember our first project, you're sitting around and you're sitting around, we were sitting there with, um, Mark Preston, who we're still friends with and part of a um, community interest company we set up, who's, um, he runs Tech Cheetah Formula E company. Um, he was, and at the time, he was just about to set up Formula E. He was part of that group. And we had Malcolm McCulloch, who's an amazing entrepreneurial professor. We had Phil Shabbat, who's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Mike Potts, who's one of Mark's friends. They set up Street Drone together. Another entrepreneur, and you're sitting there going, right. Um, uh, what do I know? <laughs> it's like, but they they were lovely. They're lovely people, and I think that what they they build up your confidence to know that everyone knows a lot about something. Yeah, and if and, and look and, and what we've found out is quite often people come to the public sector with a solution and they don't understand. Um, they don't always understand the issue, the problem. Yeah, um, but quite often they don't understand as well the regulations around things. Yeah. Yeah, and they can just people can develop something quite it's quite a long way, and then find this actually you need a legal change, or, yeah. or there's a process that takes ages that holds this actually turning into a commercial proposition. So that's what we found quite quickly. You know, you were able to um, shine a light on that area, and um, and it, and and they were just very good at very inspirational as well. So do you have a, a lot of collaborations with uh, Oxford, Oxfordshire University now then? What yeah, Oxford I think University? we've got, um, I think at the moment we've got about 10 projects that they're involved in. 
Wow. So that's really changed over the eight years you've been with, with our yeah. then. Yeah, and we worked. So we worked really closely with the knowledge exchange team as well. There's a, there's a guy called Phil Clare. There, he's still there, and, and Stuart Wilkerson who worked in there. They're brilliant people. And I think they they just come in at a similar time, so they always had. That, it was a bit of serendipity, and that they had that remit to um, to open up the university as well. So we you know we worked really well together, and and we we set up uh, bigger networking groups like Smart Toxford, which is like a smart city working groups um, and that's evolved now into something called living oxford so we're trying to create ox the whole of oxfordshire as a living lab okay um, and li living oxford isn't the lab itself it's the framework to support sort of lab propositions at a local level yeah um, so we've got we're going to have we've got one developing in harwell which is really exciting built by on the sort of big campus there we've got a, a new development at ensham which is a little village outside oxfordshire which is a garden village but that's another one we're working on and we're also working with Vista to use Vista for various elements and various different sites dotted around including Oxford itself and the many development sites that come out there um, and the idea there is to try and connect the learning because we found that a lot of innovation happens in very sector specific ways particularly in the UK we're not very good at cross crossing over the learning yeah um, you know I think th some you've seen in, in Germany, they seem to do it maybe a bit better sometimes. Some of the Fraunhofer's, they've got so many different types that they overlap better. Um, so that's the idea is to get that shared learning. And when you get crossovers of sectors, you, that's where the opportunities happen. And the idea of living options is the support framework to make that, you know, to fuel it. Make yeah. sure it happens quickly and hopefully then um, something happens in Oxfordshire and we create new businesses or retain businesses, attract them or at the very worst, you know, we solve some pro major problem like the energy system <laughs> or transport or health, you know, or social, you know, it's yeah, we've got a whole stack of massive problems. So <laughs> there's plenty of opportunity. Yeah, there's always room for improvement as well, isn't there? So yeah, yeah. It sounds like Innovate UK funding is making a, making a real difference there, which is great. So yeah, I think it is. I think it's, um, you know, we'll have a moan at them quite a lot. But I think now it's, it's, I think the last few years it's done a good job. And I know the people who work in Innovate do a good job with limited resources of trying to make sure they're matching funding pots with how the market's working. And, yeah. And they've used a lot. I think, yeah, I think um, it's come on load since it was the TSB. Um, it's had a much bigger impact. So I think that's been a big change. You mentioned earlier, um, uh, or the, you know, Oxford has been, been sort of uh, viewed as this sort of living lab. And I know from our previous conversations, we've talked about different Web3 projects that, that you're up to over there. Um, connected autonomous vehicles projects would be really cool to hear about. But another one that you mentioned when we spoke last was um, to do with drones, which I also thought was really interesting. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've got a, we've, it's a project we've just been awarded. It's part of... Um, one of the the, 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 um, the COVID response challenges from Innovate UK. Um, we, so we've been working on drone projects for about four years, I think. Various different partners, we've looked at different applications um, and we've nearly got them over the line but for one reason or the other failed. But this one's been really interesting. So this is um, looking at delivering uh, medicine supplies into rural areas. Um, so we found during lockdown in particular it was start to become a really big issue. So Oxford is the most rural county in the southeast. Is it really? Okay. Yes. So and it is a very rural county. Once you, you know, there's there's some small. Nowhere's massive. Oxford itself isn't a very large isn't a very large city, um, and then there are other towns are sort of quite large. Banbury's eighty thousand or so. That's the next biggest. So that gives you a scale of how big, mostly smaller market towns really. And then it's very rural. Once you get into the Cotswolds, um, it's very rural area. Uh, so there are lots of issues. Um, and obviously they don't have easy access to pharmacies in particular. So while their online prescription services were get, was getting much better, something where GPs and NHS managed to actually implement something they probably should have done years ago quite quickly, but they did it. Um, they still had to get the medicine. And there was a real issue there because 
the people who were being asked to shield and self-isolate couldn't get what they needed. So we're looking at, um, this is a solution, and we're working with the Thames Valley Pharmacy Network, who see it as a real solution as well. So we're going to do a, a sort of trial using one base station, because it's based from a pharmacy, um, and we're going to look to try and um, uh, serve, we're looking at maybe up to three locations in rural areas, um, okay. and we're looking at medicine. We mo- we're starting to now to even explore whether um, you could use things like um, the um, the tests as well so the COVID yeah. tests and getting them out to people so then that stops the the need for people who are at the highest risk from having to go anywhere yeah at least they just have to stay within their village at worst or a friend could go and pick them so it just quickly gets it reduces some of that risk and we and then uh, as the costs have come down on on, on on drones as well we're looking it might actually be something that's much more viable yeah the rural areas then sending out I mean, if you talk to some of the pharmacy networks they were sending out vans with sort of two two prescriptions yeah so you're like it's just it's 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 quite nice because as well the prescriptions are light so the main problem with drones at the moment is the payload yeah particularly with the drones that we can fly um so you need something that's light so it's, it's that thing where sort of all the all the different restrictions and prob and then, and then the problems have come to align to actually go yeah this is actually useful and there's a lot of excitement in the industry to say that this could be part of the solution um because they can get it down to a reasonable cost um so our so we've got um we've got a company that's going to be providing the service we've got the pharmacy networks we're essentially providing that local management again like we do with calves so it's the how do you run how do you permission this how do you do this safely? So that's why we're only going to do a restricted number of routes. Okay. Um, because at the moment in the UK, it's not clear. We believe that the sort of permissioning of drones is probably going to fall on local authorities. Right. Not the Civil Aviation Authority because <clears throat> they're flying below their area of um, where they control. So we think it will probably come to us. And that's we don't, they haven't, there hasn't been a decision made, but so we're, we're, we're taking the learnings we've taken from um, autonomous vehicles where that's what our role has been about. How do we, um, how do we play our part in making sure things are tested safely? Yeah. Um, so again, it's all around permissioning, um, you know, routing, um, also with an eye on the future about how you can start to look at sort of dynamic systems that give automatic permissioning, et cetera. So it's a similar thing. So we can take some of that learning and put it over to drones. It's slightly different in that, you have a very different type of space and, and very, lots of different um, considerations, things like pylons. You don't have to worry about pylons with the, and, um, and routing like that. MOD airspace. There's a lot of MOD airspace in Oxfordshire, so we have to think about that with routing. There's big areas it just won't be able to go. Yeah, don't land it on any runways. <laughs> no. And if it goes anywhere near some of the blackout spaces, they won't, those people will not be getting their far. <laughs> it will be, I suspect it will be left in pieces. <laughs> so there's quite specific routes we cannot take because um, we've got Brides Norton sitting right in the middle as well and lots of MO, other MOD sites. So um, <laughs> okay. there's quite a lot of restricted airspace in Oxfordshire. So it's, um, that's its own issue. Um, How so many th- drones will you be operating, do you think, in that project? At the moment, I think we're going to do it essentially off one service, so it might be two drones. Okay. Um, but it's so it's a really short, sharp one. It's, it's a six-month trial. Yeah. Um, proper, like short proof of concept. Um, the aim is to uh, is to either release a little bit of extra funding at the end to carry on doing it, but there's actually quite a lot of excitement from the partners to look at um, developing it as a into a sort of commercial model because. Um, that that issue, that rural accessibility issue, has always been there. Yeah, um, it's just that sort of COVID and shielding has just made that. I think it's where it shined a light on the really serious issues, you yeah. know, like the real problems, and they've always sort of been there. It just it's really focused them because these are proper life and death issues. If you can't don't get people's insulin to people, things like that, you know, then yes. that's a big problem. So that's what we're talking about. It's get the medicine they need to live really um, to them in a timely manner and reduce stress and stuff as well because that's the problem 
I think it's always got there. It's just that, you know, when you're, people have been running out of medicine within a day of running out, it's, it's just more stress than you need at the moment. Yeah. And, um, I spent enough drones specifically for um, transporting wine across the country as well. So you well, <laughs> you can see where it goes, can't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, a door-to-door service for those shielding. <laughs> Yeah, Just my mother wine lands in your hand. Thank you. <laughs> my mother lives in uh, in Sidmouth, which is uh, which is pretty remote. So I think yeah, if, if she can't get access to her gin and tonics, there might have to be the gin and tonic drone visiting. <laughs> 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 Sorry, mum, if you're watching this, by the way. Um, so um, real time data is a, a quite a hot topic at, at the moment, and um, actually following on from the sort of drone discussion there there's a lot of real-time data that will play a role in that as people yeah. prescriptions become available they need to then get access to those drugs within a certain period of time and permissioning is really important because you don't want to drop yeah. these drugs off to the wrong people and accidentally give out a wrong wrong prescription as well yeah um but where else in oxfordshire in in the different projects you're involved with is is real-time data really important what 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 else you know could good availability of quality real-time data benefit oxfordshire yes so at the the moment the area we've been focusing on is has been um cycling and walking data Mm. Um, because um again with um covid restrictions we were discouraging public transport use um, which is an issue in Oxford because it's a heavily, it's a well-used um, bus system in Oxford. Um, and then to counteract that, we were trying to encourage cycling and walking. But cycling is already, we're already the second highest cycling city in uh, the UK. Um, so only Cambridge has a higher level. Right. Um, which always a sore point. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it's, I would say it's not because of all our wonderful work. It's more because of just, the university's been there. It's the historic legacy of having that number of people cycling means it's safer to cycle. Right. Because you're just there in numbers. And yeah. as a, if you drive around Oxford, you should expect cyclists. Our infrastructure isn't great. We've got a lot of plans to now improve it. But one of the key things, so with, with uh, the, the funding we're trying to get in now to improve those, uh, some of that infrastructure again, um, one of the key things we lacked was data on cyclists. Mm. Um, so we had a few loops, but they're on cycle lanes. And if you know anything about UK cyclists, the majority of cyclists cycle on the road. Competent cyclists cyclists on the road. A few will cycle on the cycle. So you get a mix. Yeah. There's no consistency. And that's partly because of our poor infrastructure, <laughs> because we don't have consistent good infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so and it's, it's quicker to cycle on the road. So you've got to be able to count everyone. Um, so we had an issue with that. So we, we, um, a couple of years ago, we put in... Um, cameras with a company called Vivacity who use um, um, who use, who have all edge processing in these units. They use essentially like a you only look once algorithm, which counts things that move and codifies them. Yeah, um, but it's, they've done loads more work around um, the codification, so they're, they're validated to a very high level, uh, and they also give us other stuff like turning movements and all sorts of interesting data. Um, even travel time and stuff now. Um, but, but we're really interested in the number of people who have been cycling and also walking because we've got a lot of walking movement around Oxford. And again, we only had I think it was three points in the, in the city centre that counted pedestrians. So we need to understand that both to inform the plans, but also to look at actively monitoring them. So some of the stuff we're going to be putting in again, up to, even up to Christmas, is going is to be potentially temporary. So we're putting in at the moment something a little bit controversial, which is temporary bus gates, which is where we're trying to stop through movement of, of car vehicle traffic through the middle or through the centre of Oxford. Why people do that, I think it's bonkers, but so there we are. So we're, we're trying to because discourage bypass, that. Because of the bypass that goes around, it's just quicker, I guess, is it? Yeah, well, I, this, We've done lots of modelling that suggests it's never, ever quicker to go through <laughs> of Oxford, but <laughs> people do, um, particularly when there's issues on the network around. Yeah. Um, but it, it puts quite a lot of cars into the centre of Oxford. So we're, we're doing that. Um, they're temporary. And we're, part of that is to try and encourage the levels of cycling. So it, it reduces the amount of cars going through. And hopefully the, and the cars that don't need to be in the centre are taken out. 
Um, so we encourage um, cycling at a, again and make it um, feel safer without the infrastructure which is coming obviously over many years. Um, so to see, so one of the things we need to do there to see if it's having an impact is real data, is real time data. Yeah. So we just so we we started to combine the cameras. We've got about eighty cameras across the city now. We're combining that data with other data from Strava. Mm. So we're just taking in Strava data, which is, again is really useful for sort of that to get that data for the whole of the county. Yeah. Um, and it's also been. Um, so Strava has done quite a lot of work now about um, um, doing some estimations of overall population use, not just Strava app users, and that's that's been really helpful. And a then we've also a telco is providing data as well. Well, so we can't afford telco data. <laughs> okay. That's the problem. I think telco data is very expensive. We would have it; we can happily have it, but it's just very expensive. So we're trying to, you know, like for. For a tranche of telco data, we're running the Vivasti cameras for a few years. Yeah. Um, Strava, we've, we've got a, a deal with, so we're sort of working with them to do proof of concept. But hopefully when it gets to sort of ongoing costs, it'll be reasonable. Yeah. Um, um, so we're, I mean, so I, I think if we're looking at data, so we're actually at the moment, so that's it, what sits alongside this is we, we, we did an innovation procurement partnership um, last year to look at building a new transport model mm. um, because they were based on quite static instruments. So we're trying to build one that, uh, or we were encouraging the market to build a model that could start not necessarily from day one, but eventually be built in a way that allows to have a, a real time modeling tool. So it, it would almost be a predictive analytics tool. Yeah. So, so you could see how, if you can get enough data into it, it'd almost run in the background. Yeah. Um, and that's what we were thinking. So it becomes not just a modeling tool for policy and big schemes. It's also a network management tool. And so it changes. It's what yeah. it can do. And presumably um, forecast off of it as well. Then if you yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, so we're, we're, we're doing that as well. So we're trying to put all this data in a format that gets into the model. So we're using mobile phone data for that, but that's almost just to like baseline validate. If right. you were look, if you looked at, having a continual tranche of mobile data going into it, it would be cost, it'd be a horrendous amount of money. Right, okay. Um, and that's something we're still having discussions with telcos. It, the, the cost of telephone data just hasn't come down very much. Um, but then I suppose if, it's one of those things where I can understand from their point of view, they've got to make some profit. And if not lots of people, if not, there aren't lots of people buying it all the time, they're charging quite a good chunk for yeah. smaller amounts of use. Um, so we're looking at ways of how we probably take that in, use it almost like as a validation set of data, and then have live the data we can get hold of. So we're putting together different data streams that might form that constant data. And maybe once a year or however often you, you take a, a set of data from um, mobile phones and do a, yeah. like a validation check against it. So you do, you, it's your baseline check. So. But we don't know. I mean, that we're still working that out. But it's it is an issue. The cost of data is still a big issue. It's interesting, isn't it? Because actually, the the individual that's producing the data from their cell phone, um, you know, when they signed up to take in the phone, it wasn't because they thought, "Oh yeah, my yeah, the telco is going to use my data and sell it to someone else yeah. and make money on top." It was just so they could access, be able to use a mobile phone. And the assumption is that the telco makes money directly from that. But actually, this is another product the telco offers, makes margin on that as well. And there's no benefit to the individual. And actually, what we're saying here is that probably most people in Oxfordshire would quite willingly say, yeah, Oxfordshire Council can have my data if it's going to improve the area where I live. Yeah, but that that opportunity for them to actually say to the telco, yes, you can use my data for free for this, actually, or yeah. if not for free, at least give us a little bit in return because this is an extra product you're selling now. So it's um yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? How that little challenge there it could be resolved very e easily, actually, if the yeah. individual was the one that had the choice on how their data was used. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think. Um... I suppose, you know, trying to not completely attack the telcos, I, su I suppose, I don't know, 
but I'm, I assume one of the reasons why we get competitive rates is because they're also making profit from this. And if you took the profit from that, they would have to charge you more as a user. Sure. I yeah. suppose that's their argument. I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I don't. I mean, the amount of money they must make from the government isn't that much. I, I can't. You know, if you look at because we haven't got the budgets to pay for it. So it's not. If you look at across the UK, then it, and then spread it across all the users, it's pennies. Yeah, it must be per user. So yeah, it would be. It would be not. I mean, it may be a, that's something that government starts to look at because you know they're they're starting to bring national data sets together. They've, they're effectively forcing the bus companies to open up their data. Mm. Um, Amusingly, they've just nationalised the railway because of COVID, which <laughs> makes everyone who's saying that you should be should have done that years ago laugh because they obviously they wouldn't. Um, I don't think anyone foresaw this government doing that, um, but it means you get that that data set as well. Um, so there's, I think, DFT. There's a group, a small group in DFT working a lot with us. So we're doing some projects with them. We. We did a project looking at sharing parking data across the whole of um, what's called England's economic heartland, but it's the bit between Oxford and Cambridge and all the counties in between, just to test how if we can get a shared data set across a wide area, it starts to become both useful operationally and yeah. useful for the user. So I, th I think maybe we, we might get towards there. That's part of... Um, almost spectrum licensing and you can see it why can't we tap you know when we do 5g license auctions which will come up we could add it into that couldn't we mm, yeah and so to get one you've got to release data just to government and we could it could be something that we could get an additional benefit from because at the moment the only way to do it is you get you you get companies that will make an app on top and no one needs another thing running in the background yeah 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 um, so yeah, just another thing to wear down what is already a useful yeah. battery in your phone. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. it's, it's a pain. I mean, I'm, I'm, we've done some stuff with Google as well and used their data, but, you know, there's always going to be a cost to that as well. Mm. Um, and it's still, I'm still not completely clear what their business model is with um, transport data. Yeah. It seems to go in and out of fashion within their own large mega business. Yeah, <laughs> I know there's a lot of discussion in the automotive industry from the work that we've been doing um, about trying to open up the data that vehicles produce. And yeah. we, we had Continental on the other week um, who were talking about data marketplaces and how they potentially see an emergence of those in years to come with vehicle data being in those yeah. marketplaces and being made available. And I guess particularly for the transport side of analysis, that's, that's fantastic data because you don't then have to, you know, whittle down from all the telco data. Is it a, yeah. is it a car or is it a bus or is it this or is it that? You, you know from the outset what it is. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really useful data. We're doing a, a project with Ford, um, which is, um, and the Vivacity are part of that, actually. So we're, we're combining data there. That's focused on, actually focused on safety. Okay. Um, so we're looking at um, we're looking at overlapping um, the car movements and velocity data. So at junctions in particular, um, to to look at things like um, where there's issues maybe that um, with potential clash between cars and cyclists, um, and also looking at things like air quality and and obviously the movement data as well. We'll get from that as well. But that'll be really interesting. So that yeah. that that kicked off quite recently so we're we're only at the start of it but again that, you can see there's that's been really exciting because we've been talking to them for quite a while um so that's going to be interesting to see what we can get out of that but I, yeah i do i do think maybe we'll start going direct um it's, it's it's a frustration though isn't it because the frustration thing is you know there are companies that just have that are almost you can have the data you need yeah but what what may happen which is partly because of the way that they control their data is you put together multiple data sources. So you're creating another job to create, a, to bring in loads of data sources, do the cleansing, the validating, because you can get, I can get 10 data sets cheaper than one. Yeah. Yeah. Through, through deals, you know, then that's through, some of them will be data exchange deals. So like we're part of Waze. Okay. And that's a good yeah. partnership, you know, and that's essentially we don't pay for that, but we provide data to them around things like uh, roadworks and 
yeah things like that and we'll get some data from them that's that's really interesting um we started we've used a little bit of that data to start to look at whether we can take some of the data that comes out of that around um congestion points around mm -hmm. the network so where they're in random locations so more of the rural areas again and just yeah looked at them to see actually is there an issue with that junction and could you do a small improvement that then stopped stopped that issue um so that's that's been interesting so again it's using data to then really efficiently spend the the, the money that we have when we don't have enough money to do everything yeah yeah, yeah. so there's so there's people there's companies like that which have been good and they've they've got a really interesting community as well in the same way with telcos, in, I mean, in the automotive industry, if it was down to the individual that was deciding whether their data could be used for something, people living in Oxfordshire again would probably say, okay, if it's going to help reduce congestion, yes, of course you can have my yeah. data, you know, use it for, for what you need to do. And um, I think if we, can, if we can move towards this situation where the individual has more of a say on what their data is used for, then we can yeah. start to actually see a lot of these different opportunities open up. But whilst it's a third party deciding how data that we produce as individuals, individuals is used, then, you know, it really holds back on some of these interesting developments. Yeah. And it, it, I think it aligns with things like um, with health as well. So you've got, yeah. um, so we've, we're trying to do some projects with, with healthcare and social care, but wider healthcare as well. And if you can, a couple of the companies we've, we're working with or developing projects with have started to develop these sort of, um, I suppose their, their personal data, their secure personal data rooms, for one of better words. <laughs> I should think of a technical word, but I can't think of what, but that, so that, but that's where you you keep, you know, you're, you can keep your personal data secure and allow access to specific elements of it on a permissioning basis. Okay. I yeah. thought, I, I know that's, I mean, that's developed for a few years now. I remember, the company we're talking to now, I remember hearing them talk about it a couple of years ago, and they've done really interesting stuff in Iceland where mm -hmm. public health data is open any, to some extent, or it's open, it can be open on an individual permission basis. So it gives you the system to permission easily. Um, and it seems to be that that's where you could have your data as well, you know, your, your movement data. And, yeah. And it wouldn't take it much, would it? it, it effectively, you permission an app to. to to talk to your data log and um i don't i you could i think that you could do that i suppose it's i suspect it's more likely the sort of thing the eu would bring in than commercial because it's it's hard to see the commercial benefit there's a very big societal benefit um i think it would open up a lot of new potential business opportunities so yeah yeah certainly it, in like things like the health sector but that's yeah. i suppose that's where you you need a very open-minded business, don't you, to do yeah. that, to know that to, they're backing themselves to go, well, okay, we'll lose that little bit, but that's because we think we can create some bigger things here. Yeah. Um, and that's the problem is, the reality is, there's, there's still not that many open-minded, <laughs> when it comes to it, they sort of still do close down. Yeah, um, yeah. It takes one, doesn't it? And then it triggers the rest, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, we need a big one. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe if Apple turned around and did it, you'd be, we'd be done then, wouldn't we? <laughs> maybe it should be a Bill, if Microsoft, Bill Gates Foundation type thing, shouldn't it? <laughs> indeed, indeed. It's a big societal benefit project. I'd make a statement. So we, we've, uh, we've touched on um, the AI projects. We obviously touched on that, briefly touched on your connected autonomous vehicle project and, and, and lastly into, into data. Is uh, Oxfordshire also use, making use of blockchain in any way? I know you've said permissioning in a number of times there, so I'm curious if that is um, a permissioned blockchain or if it's just a, a permission system or you know, how is Oxfordshire looking at blockchain as, as a possible tool for some of its projects? So yeah, we've we've um, we've looked at it within a couple of bids. Yeah, we haven't won any bids with it in. It's sort of it's on it's on the horizon, I think. So we've, we there's a number of different partners and we and people within the university actually as well. Yeah, um, that we're talking to, but how? It, I think it's going to be the answer. So that the the problem is at the moment we should be looking at it more to some extent because. 
it could allow us to get to, to move on quite quickly once we sort some of the fundamentals out. I think the problem is at the moment, our fun, the fundamentals are things like just getting the data all in one place. Yeah. Um, and that's been a bigger problem to overcome than maybe we thought it would be. Okay. Um, and that's and that and that that's it is a problem, and that's partly just due to lack of investment. Um, there's big issues in the UK in terms of we invest in capital projects and not the data, and not the information of how you manage the project. So we've you know, every year we spend a lot of money on building another 0.5 percent of the capital infrastructure assets we have. Not very much money on managing the 99.5 percent of the assets we have out there. It's yeah, but well, that's because that's revenue money and not capital, and it's how. It's logged on treasury and debt and all the things that I don't even want to know about. But, um, you know, I, I'm a big advocate that if you could, you could spend a lot less money overall, if it was revenue money on managing the stuff you have better now than spending capital, and it'd also reduce your carbon footprint. Yeah. But, the thing is, as well, data could be the thing that actually pays for public infrastructure in well, the future. So yeah, it, it could be, it, yeah. I don't think we're that far away from actually changing some of the thinking on that and how like building toll roads, for example, I'm writing a paper at the moment on how you could partially fund a toll road by actually selling the data of the people actually using the toll road. And it could be an alternative way of financing at least part of that, that yeah, infrastructure yeah. that's being yeah, used. And, and, and even and the services. Not? Yeah. I, I think yeah. we've got to have a bit, an eye on the longer term. I, I do think there's bits of government starting to think like that. It's frustrating that, and there's a few authorities starting to look like there's not enough. You know, we, we need to all be looking at it. Um, yeah. and, and that's the frustrating. I thought more of us would be by now. But if you look at blockchain, so where it comes in is if we're, if we're looking five years ahead, what are we trying to build? What we like is, is a, you could say digital twin. I hate that word. But <laughs> it's some sort of, we've got a, a system of, a, a management system that allows us to we, that we've got decent real-time data allows us to actively manage our place because it goes yeah. beyond transport it's energy systems it's even access pedestrian can you know where do you make allow areas to become maybe more dynamically pedestrian things like that um so with all of that you're going to have loads of different permissioning systems because you might have without you'd want with relatively little notice to change the way it the network works now with connected vehicles theory, theoretically that's all possible because you can get an you can get something to the car or to the person if, even if they're riding a the bike you get it to them via some by the phones or whatever they bike to less of an issue but some of the bike delivery companies would want that um, you can get the information to them but what, what you need is to is to know that that thing has the permission to do x y and z if you're thinking about deliveries in particular yeah so I think where you've got blockchain coming in, it's where you might have, so really specific use case that seems to be, is where you've maybe closed the city down much more, but you've got disabled parking. So why don't disabled badge holders have effectively a blockchain system? Because mm. um, you know that's their permission. You know, the, like a disabled badge, you, one of the biggest issues with disabled badges is fraud. Well, that could get rid of that. Yeah. If you have effectively connected car parking spaces, which is what we're trying to work to, yeah. You've got the ability for it to talk to each other and go, yes, you can park here. Yeah. And you, you are allowed in this zone. Yeah. You could have and the it, barrier dropping when the when the transaction or when the smart contract is triggered for the disabled person pulling up. So they yeah. know, okay, this car's got the RFD that triggers the smart contract, bollard yeah. drops, and then they can park in the space. And there's there's absolutely no way of anyone else getting in there then, is there? Yeah, so. and I and I think the reason why blockchain come becomes part of that, because there's plenty of people trying to do this and they go that i can get around this it's the it's the anti-fraud element yeah yeah and that's the reason because if you if you think you've just if you digitize your parking badge well it the same thing happens as happens before they just pass it around don't they yeah absolutely you know, so the one disabled badge becomes used by 10 different vehicles or whatever you know <laughs> and i'm sure there'll be ways of copying it and all sorts of stuff so the blockchain element means that that's yours and that what you have to then make sure is that it's it's simple to use. So it is almost the blockchain is a complicated element that sits behind it that people don't even have to understand. That's how it's working. Exactly. They don't yeah. need to know that they've given a system that there you go. This works in your car. Yeah. Um, 
um, or via your phone or however you decide to implement it. But it's it's a permission. It's just only you can use it with yeah these these spaces or whatever. Um, and I think so. We're close to that. So there's things like that where I'd like to see us test it on specific use cases. I think some of the stuff we've done in the last few years has just been too big. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you just focus on that, it's a very small user group. Yeah. They've got a very distinct need. They have a very distinct problem if we start to close more of the cities, which if you look around Europe, that's a big trend now. Yeah. So disabled access is a big issue to get over that problem. And you think, well, we still want to try and get yeah. access into those areas for the, that user group. Yeah. So let's test with that. And then again, with um, things like deliveries as well. So you could start to have, um, I think you should have restricted deliveries. Yeah. So there may be that you say, if you're X type of company, you've just got to make sure your deliveries come in these times. So that's how we do it now is we'd have restricted times and yeah. theoretically find them if they don't. I think, rarely I, find them. I think you're totally right. Sometimes when, when people think about these sorts of uh, more progressive projects, they always think really big. Yeah. And it immediately becomes really complicated and you have a lot yeah. of companies in the consortium and then all of a sudden it, it becomes overwhelming. And actually all you want to do is just test something really simple yeah. just to see how it works. Like, am I sending gin or insulin to this person with a drone? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> keep it simple. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just prove that it works and then, you know, scale up from there rather than, you know, let's have... 50% of the vehicles in Oxfordshire all participating in a pilot. and Yeah, and it would just, <laughs> and you'd know it would go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And we, so we did a little, we actually did use disabled parking just to start our first test of, um, of monitored parking based the sensors. So we test different types of sensors, how they worked, and we uh, promoted a, um, a tool, an app tool again, that for um, disabled um, badge holders. So essentially, they were guided to the disabled bays, um, because they Oxford. They're all they're in really random places. <laughs> so you do actually need. So if you if you've not come to Oxford, you do have, it does help, um, and it would also tell you if so they were occupied or not. But that's quite a nice, neat little project. Um, I think the, the frustration is there. Then you go right. Well, that does work. That makes sense. How do we then make this into a bigger thing? And it's we need. In my mind, you need a few places you were going to do proof of concepts and then a knowledge that there's a bigger yeah. uh, either commercial investment or set of funding or probably a bit of both. It's a bit of both sides. So we need much we need to do much more work of lining up more traditional funding like DFT funding alongside commercial investment. Yeah. Which is like an iteration on from Innovate UK, because you're probably moving you're up the TRL levels a bit more. Yeah. Um, and you're in this murky world of where government does have a bit of a role, but there's a commercial proposition. If you work together, then you could actually have a viable solution. And it's, I think that's what we don't do very well. And that's why like, even when you do do small proof of concepts, they quite often fail because what's the next step is, right, we've done that one. That was a nice, neat little project. Now I'm just going to go out and raise 10 million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hold, 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 hold it there you go to investors right i've done this project with 50 bays in oxford it looks really good i'm going to extrapolate that up to i think i can capture the whole of europe and you're then um oh okay i don't think so. so i don't know you know you need you need a few of those because either if you're doing it commercially you need to go and get your investment you need to have proven it and it's hard yeah. to do that doing yeah. it that way and that's why you do need these big visions i suppose to try and get that investment in um or you do need a bit of support um from the government side because you're yeah. going to be solving a, a, a problem as well i mean i think you, you can start with a simple demonstrator can't you and then you know once you've got that then you can you can move into doing a, a, a larger pilot so you can have like series or yeah. stages of funding so you know your demonstrator could be quite low cost, and you could be doing you know multiple ones of those throughout the year through in the in the different councils, and the ones that show some some level of um, potential, then you know then you can scale it up into a bigger pilot that looks sexier ultimately yeah. to try and go after that ten million pot. But at least you've done something rather than nothing. So it's yeah. it, instead of that all or nothing attitude, it's kind of like, well, here's something and it's proved this. So, okay, now we'll move to the next phase and now we'll go after the next bit of funding. And yeah, you know. 
I mean, some have done. So you, you know, look at Appy Parking. They've done a great job of start of doing this proof of concept process, and um, you know, I've got they they've moved it on now, and they I think they're going for the, um, the big investment rate at the moment, and they've got a few different authorities they're working with, and but it's it's I mean, it's hard old work to get it through, and and it's almost there's only there's very few companies that manage to get up to that level. There's a lot of good ideas left, and I know there's that sort of almost test. You know, it's, it's the it's the half of the success is built on the drive and simulation of the people involved in it. Yeah, but it's frustrating sometimes because some good ideas are left behind because they're not, they're quite often driven by the person who isn't that bothered about the commercial aspect. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, and there's that we we get that we get that a lot I think in local government especially when you're working on the university side. Yeah. It's, it's like they want to move on to the next idea. They don't want to commercialise this thing. So there's, there's opportunities like that. And it, I think if you had a bit of a structured, yeah, stage process and much and more places like, like ourselves, you need, we probably need about 50 towns or cities in country doing this much on a more consistent framework. Like, that's the other problem we have in the UK. Everything's competitive. Mm. So you have these competitive rounds for not enough money to do something and it so you end up with different things being done all over the place a few companies you could say maybe not selling the best thing solution into these because some of the large companies are sort of iterating at the side they're not really innovating yeah um because the support system to for a local government to interact with um startups and sort of more entrepreneurial companies isn't really there it's very hard for them to do that. And a lot of those companies don't even know how to get into the procurement and tendering processes. There's, there's something there where one of the solutions is, is some of the boring stuff like procurement. It's still yeah. a big issue of yeah. how do you get, and, I, and, and the, you know, the catapults have done it a bit, but they've not done it enough. Um, they need to, you know, and I, and I think that's because they're just not close enough to the, the problem is in, in the council. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll, bang my drum to government all the time but there needs to be a bit more direct support to do yeah. the sort of stuff we do we're, we're really lucky but um if you look at it we've got only four of our staff are paid for by the council the most are paid most of them have been are paid for by project funding so we've got 20 right. 24 crikey that's brilliant yeah um but even then you know i suppose we're lucky that we've got four staff paid for by the council most councils that I talk to are starting to look in this world yeah. I've got one or two people and it's very, when you've got one, I would say it's impossible. Yeah. Two, you've got a chance. We started with two and grew it, but only if you're willing to do two jobs. Yeah. And that's what I've always said as well. Like when we started, we, we worked two jobs at the same time. We did our job for the council and then did all the bid writing and network and development writing as well as it. So yeah. there was many, uh, you because know. you were passionate about it and you wanted yeah. to. Yeah, and I think, yeah, and that's what you see when you go around the UK and the Europe as well. The places that are doing it are led by people who want to, are enthusiastic to do that. Yeah. Um, which I think is right. I think that should be rewarded. Um, but you've also got to get it into almost the data. So this, isn't, this isn't a nice to have anymore. Teams like us have to be in councils. Absolutely. If they do not innovate and iterate quicker I mean, there's serious issues going to happen because you've, both, you've got two issues at the moment. You've got a lack, lack, less, less and less funding, which means you've got to try and do things with less funding, so you've got to innovate to do that. You've also got a completely different user group. Yeah. So you've got a younger generation that expects something to be digital and quick and yeah. change. and move. You've also got an older generation that are digitally native. Yeah. So you've got people retiring and going into adult social care, like people we who are like, why isn't this go Why doesn't this work for a bloody Amazon Echo Show? Or uh, you know, I should be able to go. Okay, Google, tell me you know when my medicine chips are, and you don't have this service. And we're in an adult social care. We're still trying to sell them these you know, outdated yeah. technology, and they're like, what are you talking? I can go on Amazon now and buy something better. This it's like we're not catching up quick enough with our of our own population. I can just requirement. see. I can just see someone in the countryside now seeing a drone going across, getting the shotgun out. Is that <laughs> bloody UFO doing over there, <laughs> shooting it out. The sky. <laughs> yeah. 
Hi, Llewellyn, look, it's been great having you on the podcast. Really enjoyed this conversation. I hope, yeah, hope you've enjoyed good. it as well. And yeah. um, let's do it again at some point in the future and, and hear yeah, more about what Oxfordshire's up to. Um, yeah. Have a great day. Thanks very much. Cheers. If you enjoyed listening, don't forget to rate and subscribe to our podcast. And please do share your feedback with us. Thanks for joining the TX podcast. See you again. Thank you.